The penultimate plenary lecture is the second and final early career talk, and that will be given by Jana Tomova. She is an associate professor in the Robotics Perception and Learning Department at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. She works in the area of formal methods and verification as applied to robots and robotic problems and planning. And this is an area, although I don't publish indirectly, I have a, an acquaintance with the ongoing work there. And she's one of these people where the, her name keeps showing up over and over again. And so it was a very pleasant surprise when the awards committee had told me that she'd been selected to give this lecture. So the floor is yours, Jana. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very honored and excited to be giving an early career spotlight he talk here at the RSS 2021. Um, I have to confess that uh, when I started preparing uh, this talk, um, I kind of binge watched all the past early career spotlight talks that I could find online. And I got very much amazed yet again uh, by how broad robotics is as a research field, um, how diverse and how good it is at adopting uh, techniques and principles from other fields to solve as many uh, challenging problems and questions. So today uh, I will be here as an advocate for adoption of techniques based in formal methods. And I hope that at the end of the talk you will um, get to see what we can use for and uh, what we gain from uh, doing so. So what are these formal methods and uh, why should we use them? Uh, there are a bunch of definitions out there, but usually they agree on something along the lines that they are rigorous techniques for specification, development, verification and analysis of systems. Now, uh, the specification part that's very, very well aligns with uh, the question, how do we tell robots what to do? And the development, verification, and analysis of systems that corresponds to how do we ensure that our robots behave as expected. So, uh, in my group and in my uh, in my research, I focus mainly on temporal logics and formal synthesis as uh, two formal methods um, toolboxes or methodologies. And here is why. As specification language, temporal logics are rich, rigorous, and they have some resemblance to natural language. Let's take a look at an example. So I have here an environment. There is a robot, of course. There are three offices, A, B, C there. Uh, I have a bunch of plants there, desks, Wi-Fi routers, staircase, and a charging station. And let's say that we want our robot to patrol offices A, B, C. And uh, this is how I could express this uh, in LTL specification language. Uh, GFA, GFB, GFC. G stands for globally. F stands for eventually. So GFA says globally, eventually, uh, visit region A. Or visit that region infinitely many times, which is pretty much keep patrolling that region. Now, another task that we could take a look at is whenever you spot danger, go directly to the staircase and wait, wait there for all clear signal before continuing. And this could get translated into an LTL formula always, or globally, when there is danger. Then the next X steps should be staircase and you should stay there until you all is clear. Another task that we could give a robot is to make sure to recharge at least every 10 minutes and this uh, contains explicit timing constraint. Uh, the formula would look like GF, interval 0, 10, we charge. That interval is telling me exactly that that eventually should always happen between 0 and 10 minutes. Uh, and finally, we could even have spatial constraints. We, we can say stuff like, at all times, stay within five meters from the Wi-Fi router. And the formula would be in signal temporal logic this time, and it would say globally or always, the distance from the router and the robot should be smaller or equal than five. That's why we use temporal logics. Uh, the reason why we use formal synthesis is that they can provide a correct by design plan. So they can turn the what into the how. Uh, informal synthesis takes a system 
and an objective, uh, as we have seen, and it needs the system to be modeled somehow. Now, the model that corresponds to the system quite well and the model that formal synthesis can work with are somewhat different. Uh, the robot would be represented as a differential equation or some sort of dynamical system, whereas the formal synthesis typically needs something discrete. So that's why when talking about model, I will be talking about model and abstraction as a simplified version of that model. And uh, the objective we have already seen, we can, uh, we can express in a temporal logic. That goes to formal synthesis, the abstraction and the logic specification. What we get out is a correct by design plan, or we get an information that there is no correct by design plan. Now, it is important to understand that formal synthesis is not an algorithm that takes one model or one abstraction and one temporal logic specification. It takes any model in a particular modeling language and any uh, formula in a particular temporal logic. So you always just need to press a button saying synthesize and you get the plan out of it regardless of what exactly and uh, the formula and the model are. The second important thing to understand here is that when I say plan, I do not mean just a sequence of, uh, of actions. It could actually be a feedback plan or a history-dependent policy. Uh, when I started my PhD in 2009, uh, this field was very much uh, beginning and we, uh, some seminal works just came out. Uh, the abstractions were quite simple. It was deterministic transition systems or non-deterministic transition systems, essentially. And the temporal logics uh, we could handle was LTL or some fragments to make the formal synthesis more scalable. Now, when I graduated in 2013, Hadas Kresgazid was here and gave her uh, early career spotlight at RSS uh, on high-level verifiable robotics. By then, the community started dealing with much more complex systems, uh, like multi-agent systems, uh, working in partially unknown or dynamic environments, with much more interesting objectives, like temporal goals with additional optimization criteria and various deadlines. Uh, the models that we could handle were also more complex. There were some initial works on nonlinear models and models with disturbances. Uh, we could do much more in terms of uh, the, the, the models that go into the formal synthesis, we could do roadmaps and trees that come from sampling-based algorithms, uh, weighted transition systems to address uh, time constraints, or um, MDPs to consider probabilistic aspects. Temporal logic specification uh, has some resemblance to natural language, but it's far from being user-friendly, so there was some focus also on building user-friendly interfaces, either linguistic or graphical. And finally, the temporal logic uh, specifications that we could deal with also grew to probabilistic logics and metric temporal logics. Uh, as of today, we have moved on. Uh, the community has started relaxing uh, many assumptions we need on our models start dealing with more complex robots, so consider sophi more sophisticated logics for explicit spatial and temporal constraints, like signal temporal logic. And we started moving from controlled and constrained environments and combined formal methods with uh, many complementing techniques. They get integrated in uh, complex uh, robotic scenarios, and one of them uh, I want to show you through our Code for Robots project. EU project where we considered um, on-demand transportation tasks for a factory-inspired uh, assembly station. So multiple robots here periodically check assembly stations for finished products, and finished products are delivered to the next production station, the, the assembly station is monitored for supply, and if something is missing, mobile robots provide the required part. The plan behind uh, this scenario is uh, the mission and motion plan is generated via formal synthesis. And there is, of course, a lot of other techniques on top of it, including perception, gesture recognition, uh, and so on. 
Now, my research group is driven by the vision of bringing the benefits of formal synthesis towards uncontrolled and unconstrained environments and more complex robots. So to do that, we identified three major challenges that we are looking at. The first one is that very often we do not get a correct by design plan. The plan just simply does not exist because there is too much uncertainty around us. So what do we do? Do we just give up or is there something that we can do that is not correct by design but correct enough? Uh, the second question that drives us is that the difference between system and model, not even the, mod the model and abstraction or a system and abstraction, but even the system and the model is quite huge. So sometimes we just don't have good enough model. And the question is, is there still some sort of guarantees that we can gain? The third challenge that we tackle is that the robots do not live in vacuum. Uh, they interact with each other and they interact with people in the environments that they exist in. So let's dig in into the first challenge, the no plan challenge. Uh, back in 2012, I was very lucky to be visiting the groups of Emilio Frazzoli and Daniel Arus at MIT, and I worked with them on a project for autonomous driving with traffic rules. We have here a system that is a, um, essentially a road segment. You just want to go to the end of the road segment, but you would like to obey the traffic rules. So um, you would like not to cross the full lane, stay in the right lane, not to enter a construction zone or not to enter a sidewalk. And of course, the idea was let's take this, um, model it, abstract it, take the traffic rules as temporal logic specifications and just feed them into formal synthesis. And it turned out that very often we were getting um, all traffic rules cannot be obeyed simultaneously in this situation. And the example that you have there is pretty much it. You cannot enter a construction zone, but you should stay in the right lane. You basically need to go around. So the question was, what can we do then? There is no support for that informal synthesis framework. And we said, let's synthesize a plan that is as correct as possible, which would mean that the traffic rules are violated only for the absolutely necessary time and only if absolutely necessary. And to address that, we had to equip LTL, that is traditionally yes or no, with some kind of quantitative semantics, quantitative evaluation, uh, that we called level of violation. So level of violation given a trace and an LTL formula would be the time duration associated with the discrete transition that need to be removed in order to make the trace satisfy the formula weighted by the penalty. When I talk about transitions that need to be removed, those are essentially the things that you did wrong and you shouldn't do. So uh, the more you do them, the higher will be your level of violation. And the penalty there is uh, prioritizing some rules over the others. For instance, staying in the right lane is probably um, less uh, important than not going on the sidewalk. Okay, and once we have this quantitative evaluation, we massage the automata-based formal synthesis algorithm to become minimum violation automata-based formal synthesis. We took our abstractions, we took our formulas representing the road rules. Each of this was translated into a finite automaton uh, via classical theoretic computer science tools. And the new thing is that we enhanced every of these finite automaton with weights. Those weights were to represent the level of violations. And then abstraction, together with this weighted finite automata, created a product automaton. In that, we found a shortest accepting run, and that projected onto the minimum violation plan. We proved with a sequence of lemmas that this, this indeed works as we think. So the minimum violation plan is provably minimally violating. Um, of course, this works well quite quite well offline if I had the abstractions, but I would like to put it on my autonomous car that is driving out there, and probably we will need some anytime uh, motion planning algorithm for that. Uh, and indeed, um, we can incrementally build a weighted product automaton instead of weighted tree, 
we can incrementally update a minimally violating path instead of the shortest path. And our optimality criterion is hence the level of violation primarily and then distance instead of just purely distance. So what we see here in this video is how it uh, ended up working. Uh, we can see RT star, MVR T star trajectory of a vehicle that uh, sees an obstacle. Uh, it goes around the obstacle, but then it returns to the right lane where it belongs. Uh, thanks to Emilio's and Daniel's amazing students, uh, we were able to put this on a golf cart already in 2013. And what you see here is uh, the car avoiding another park car and coming back to the, to the correct lane. This is not due to any if then else. This is automatically embedded in the RT star and automatically came up with. Uh, since then, since 2013, we have added a bunch of uh, extensions, including limited sensing and multi-vehicle settings with multiple autonomous vehicles that uh, are um, all autonomous and we do planning in joint space there. Um, let's take a look at a little bit more advanced settings here where we do not really have information about the state precisely. We have state estimates and we are driving on a road segment with other participants. Now our objectives can be a little bit more complex as well. They can contain various specific uh, explicit time and spatial constraints that could be expressed, for instance, in signal temporal logic this time. Now the minimum violation formal synthesis, uh, when it comes up with a plan that is as correct as possible, it needs to account for the severity of violation, the probability of violation, and also the level of uncertainty. And uh, that's what we did. So safety specification uh, is going to be always some function has to be greater than zero. So for instance, for us, uh, it's got to be that always the safety distance is smaller than the distance between the rear bumper of the leading vehicle and the front bumper of the, of the eagle vehicle. And then my severity function will tell me the severity of violation is zero if that safety specification is satisfied. And if it is violated, the severity will be proportional to how much, how longer the distance should be to be safe. Uh, now, since we have only uh, state estimates, Hat x here is a random variable with multivariate Gaussian distribution. And uh, then severity of violation is a random variable too. We measure the risk as expected severity of violation. And we put this risk into risk-aware planning, tried it on US 101 highway, se uh, highway scenario. And this is what came out. This is the 80 of the least risky uh, trajectories. The lighter the color, the less risk. Now, this severity reminds us very much of spatial robustness of STL. STL formula can look, for instance, like this, or as the safety uh, constraint before. This one says that the distance between a trajectory and the closest obstacle needs to be larger than one. So when I look at the first figure there, the first trajectory, I see that the formula is there satisfied and there is a margin of 0.5 meters that I could still use. Uh, in the second case, it is also satisfied, but it's satisfied a little bit less in a sense because my margin is only 0.1. In the, in the third case, it's actually violated and I would need 70 extra centimeters to uh, satisfy it. So let me ask you, uh, on the left trajectory, the green one, and the one in the middle, the blue one, which one would you take? Which one would you prefer, the extremely safe one or the reasonably safe but faster one? Well, it depends. Uh, so um, STL has the spatial robustness. It also has time robustness, and there's also the duration of trajectory. And all of these factors can come into play when you design the desired behavior. For instance, uh, we can use STL and different prioritization of these criteria to come up with different plans for a vehicle either that drives either a little bit more defensive or a little bit more aggressive. 
let me show you STL on a different example than autonomous driving. Uh, at some point, uh, we started talking at KTH to Patrick Jensfeld's group. They do exploration and they have this algorithm called Autonomous Exploration Planner. This is um, how their trajectories typically looked like. Um, it did the job very well, uh, but you see that the trajectories are somewhat erratic and all over the place. So we thought, what if we put STL constraints on top of it? Can we clean them up somehow, make them look better? So we said, yes, let's put STL formula and this time we will try to make the robot stay closer to the walls rather than further because walls and obstacles, that's where the interesting stuff for exploration happens. This is how the trajectories that we were getting typically looked like. And we put this in the lab in an empty room and uh, in, a, in a room equipped with furniture, standard office. And in both cases, we get this interesting side effect that uh, the exploration actually happened faster and it, sometimes it was even more complete. Now, when you look at the trajectory of, of uh, the UAV, it's still a little bit wiggly despite this, uh, this, despite this specification. And there are multiple reasons for that. One is that we have any time motion planner behind it and it's only asymptotically complete. But one of them is also that we were not bothered too much about issues of control there. But there are scenarios where, where you should be bothered, uh, like this one. So we have a parked car on a slope, on the cobblestones, and I really do not have good enough model for this car. Uh, it's impossible to get a model for every single slope and every single terrain. So that's one issue. The other issue is that it's parked tightly, so every centimeter will matter and I have to handle the uncertainty somehow. The thing that we propose to uh, handle systems that are very constrained by their space but still have uh, non-holomic constraints in their dynamics and, uh, and so on is safe multi-step feedback motion primitives. So what we do is we divide the input space into regions and linearize, linearize there. This, of course, introduces error, and that error grows as we go. But we were able to actually uh, show that the error can be corrected in k steps. Uh, k is smaller than the number of dimensions, or it's uh, at most the number of the dimensions. And what happens is that you end up in uncertain box that is smaller than the uncertain box that you started from. And this means that this is extremely suitable for chaining and satisfying long-term specifications like LTL specifications. And furthermore, it's a library of motion primitives, so if they are not enough to satisfy the LTL specifications, you can just refine them till you find a way. Uh, and indeed, we put this on our non-holonomic uh, rover, parked in a tight spot, and we were able to unpark successfully. Now, how do we actually do LTL planning with motion primitives? I take my system, that's the motion primitives. I have my objective, that's the LTL specification. I take the LTL specification and translate it into a bookie automata. And this is again, a classical step from theoretical computer science that can be done automatically. And uh, now I'm able to execute a formal synthesis essentially as a modify A star. But since I have the library of motion primitives, the branching factor is very high and I need a good heuristic. So we propose to compute backward reachability trees as a good heuristic there to get a correct by design plan or maybe refine the motion primitives and then get a correct by design plan. We put this on a rover in 2D and we were approximately 10 times faster than state-of-the-art algorithms working for non holonomic systems. And we believe that we are the first one who were able to put it into a three-dimensional system here on a fixed wing drone as well. Well, the car that I showed you parked in tight spot is not the only instance, of course, where the uncertain dynamics matters and where it's uh, critical to, to be safe. This is an example of our other work where we look into contact-rich manipulation. Here, there is basically no good model, no model to start with, everything is data-driven. 
but overheating the manipulator uh, is uh, at risk because we are operating very close to torque limits. Uh, what we did is we generated a, a trajectory to be tracked with uh, machine learning, and then we tracked it with, uh, with our safe motion primitives there. So finally, we are at our last third challenge, the interaction challenge. Uh, robots do not live in a vacuum. So here I could be talking about different kind of approaches and, and uh, it's such a broad area. Um, but the one thing I want to focus on is the social interaction uh, because we have correct by design plans, but are they going to be any useful if the people around uh, the robot do not find them acceptable? So that's the question that drives us here in a project on correct by design and socially acceptable planning that we uh, work on with uh, Yolanda Leite, a social robotist here at KTH. Um, our objective, as long as it is goals, constraints and preferences, we can fit it into our formal synthesis framework. But what if our objectives are somehow soft? What if it's social acceptability or perceived safety? What can we do then? And we just started peeking into this, uh, into this direction and the project is still in diapers. But what we do is we collect data from interactions and then we try to infer STL, signal temporal logic formulas, with probabilistic predicates as descriptions of uh, things that people do around robots and things that robots do around people. Uh, so stay tuned for more. Um, I wish I had time to talk here about uh, more interesting things that we do, uh, about aligning provable safety and perceived safety, about assumption guarantee synthesis that is very much about guarantees being very difficult to synthesize in uncertain environments unless we assume something about uh, the other intelligent agents, some level of collaboration, like that the humans will not cross on the red light. I also didn't have a chance to talk about decentralized multi-agent coordination with tem temporal logic specifications that we do here as well. The takeaways from this talk are that um, temporal logics and formal synthesis are here and they can help you address the two big questions of robotics. How do we tell robots what to do and how do we ensure that they behave as expected? They are rigorous, so they can be used to provide guarantees if that's what is desired and possible. But if it's not possible, they are not rigid. You can still you don't, still don't need to freeze if a correct by design plan does not exist. You can just uh, generate a plan that is as correct as it gets, provably. And it does not need to be rigid in uh, treating just mission and safety critical goals. It can handle preferences as well. Where I think the future of the field is going and when I know where my group is going is uh, moving forward with these techniques to the wild. So instead of well-defined mathematical objectives or rather on top of well-defined mathematical objectives, we will also include soft objectives like perceived safety and uh, social acceptability. Instead, or on top of guarantees, we will also work with softer criteria like risk awareness because guarantees are just difficult and sometimes you just get the answer there are no guarantees. Then you still are interested in doing the best you can. Uh, instead of manually created models and specifications, which was still the practice um, several years ago, we are slowly moving towards data-driven models and specifications. And Formal synthesis as an alternative to learning, uh, both to generate plans, are joining forces these days. So uh, they are taking the best of both, the guarantees and the rigorousness, and then the data and the, and the efficiency. And uh, there is a lot of focus in the community on reinforcement learning with temporal logic goals and reinforcement learning with the classical rewards, but with temporal logic constraints on the exploration phase. And then finally, I think that uh, while we are focusing on individual components, on, uh, on inside control, inside motion planning, inside mission planning, we will start more and more integrating these things across and transfer the guarantees across all the la layers of the planning hierarchy 
but also integrating it into the big system and uh, consider even different formal methods for um, the whole system view, including perception and, and all the other uh, modules of a robotic system. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening and I would like to thank my amazing group, all of my collaborators and their groups, and of course the funding agencies that are willing to support us. Thank you. If you're watching this at the time of the RSS event, this is just a reminder that on Thursday the 14th, we have two opportunities for interactive Q&A with Jana. So show up, be engaged. See you then.